Welcome, everybody. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Jared Grover. I'm the rabbi of Beth Tikva Synagogue, and I'm honored tonight to welcome virtually to our synagogue, welcome back virtually to our synagogue, Tal Kanan, the American-born entrepreneur, social activist, and author. He is the co-founder of Clarity Capital, a global asset management firm with offices in Tel Aviv and New York. He serves on the boards of directors of the Steinhardt Foundation for Jewish Life and the Hessig Foundation. He is the chairman of the Coret Economic Development Funds, Israel's largest small business and micro lending institution. Tal earned his master's degree in business administration from Harvard Business School, and he is also a graduate of Israel's Air Force Academy. Tal served as a fighter pilot in the Israel Air Force for a total of 18 years, including reserve service. Now, all of that impressive, all of those impressive accomplishments, as impressive as they are, they are not the reason why we have invited Tal back for the first time and back to Beth Tikva. It's because, and I just told him a few moments ago, even though he had no responsibility to do so, he has decided to devote his spare time to saving the Jewish people. And his introduction to the world of saving the Jewish people is his critically acclaimed book that is right behind me. Tal, at least I'm advertising the book. Where's your copy? <laughs> it's the book that's right behind me, God is in the Crowd, a bold proposal for discovering relevance in Judaism and ensuring its survival in the 21st century. In my view, it is a must read for anybody who cares about the future of the Jewish people or who cares about Israel's future. A must read. It will challenge you. Uh, it will cause you to re-examine many, uh, many, uh, many of your hypotheses about Israel and about its challenges and about its conflicts. And I, I just told Tal every time almost that I have a conversation about Israel, a really engaging conversation about Israel, there's some piece of wisdom from his book that that conversation connects to. He came to Beth Tikva in 2019, I think, or 2018 for Shavuot, soon after the book was published. But this is, the world has changed since then, as some of you may have noticed. Israel has changed since then. And I wanted to have a retake of a second uh, film, a second take of that conversation, second filming of that conversation, and invite you all to listen, to listen in, because I'd like to know from you, Tal, whether there's anything that you regret writing in the book, seeing what has changed in the world since it was published and anything that you think you would have revised or would have added to the book. So thank you very much for being here and let's just get into it. Thank you, thank you, Rabbi. And thank you, Gail. A, a, a really wonderful to be back. I wish it, it could be in person, but it, it, it's good to be with you all again. Where would you like to start? <laughs> let's start with the book. <laughs> Tell me if there's anything as you look back to this book, this is your manifesto. What do you regret writing? And where do you think you left out? Uh, where, do, where do you think you, where, what insights would you have added to the book had it been published more recently? Well, so the, there, <clears throat> there are a few things that I, I, I think I got wrong in the book, but there's only one that I regret. Um, my only regret is, uh, I think I paint Haredi Judaism with too broad a brush. So um, just for people who haven't read the book, the book divides Israel into different camps, right? And one of the camps that you speak about is the Haredi camp. And just for those who didn't read the book, you're in the book. What did you say about the threats and the opportunities posed by um, this part, growing segment of Israeli society? Well, you know, f fundamentally, you know, I, one way you can parse Israeli society is, is, 
is really into four groups on the basis of the ideology that really guides them or that connects them with, with, with Israel. Uh, and those groups are, and, and it's my, my term, so it, you know, the, 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 there, there are a lot of ways to define this, but this is my definition. The first group is what I call the secularists, yeah. um, which doesn't mean secular, right? A, a lot of secularists are religiously observant and, you know, in, in many cases, Orthodox Jews. But what makes them secularists is their vision for Jewish statehood. Uh, is a physical refuge for the Jewish people structured as a democracy. That's, that, that's, that, that's what secularism is, meaning we're not imposing religiosity on the, on, 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 the, uh, on the populace. There's a group that I call the territorialists, which is very small. Um, but uh, th these are people who believe that the land of Israel in its totality is a higher priority than preserving democracy. Right. And in many cases, even higher than preserving than, than, than survival, uh, physical survival uh, as a priority. Uh, there's a group called the Fourth Israel, which I won't get into right now. But the, the, the group that the rabbi is referencing that, that, that are called the theocrats is largely composed of ultra Orthodox Jews. Not all ultra Orthodox Jews are theocrats and, and with, with, with very few exceptions, mo most most. Uh, most theocrats are ultra-Orthodox Jews uh, in Israel. Uh, but this is a population that is growing uh, you know, really quickly in Israel that by and large sees uh, Israel, as, 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 I, I mean, as the term would, would suggest, as theocracy. Uh, this should be the ambition. Uh, and we should be imposing religiosity on, on the citizenry of, uh, uh, of, of Israel. And w without judging or rating any of those visions. Frankly, I don't think any of those visions is really adequate for capturing what, our, what the, the mission is, you know, what, what, what we're really doing in Israel. But there is one fundamental uh, truth that I, I think it's, 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 worth, it's worth acknowledging. And that is in order to survive in the Middle East, this is just the, the, the savage truth, we have to be strong militarily. There's no other choice. There is no mercy for the weak in the Middle East. We will not survive if we're not strong militarily. And the second is that we have As to be we strong. just witnessed again. Yeah, correct. And in order to be strong militarily, we need to be strong economically because it's expensive to be strong militarily. And if you look at the contribution to those two fundamental requirements for survival in the Middle East, the secularists bear almost all of that burden. They send their kids to fight our wars and they pay our taxes in Israel. The territorialists send their kids to fight our wars. And you know, as I you know, like, like to say, I think they're some of the best kids that we have uh, in, in, in the military in Israel is, is, is the children of the settlers. Um, but they're an economic drain on the country. The theocrats are both an economic drain, a, a massive economic drain, because it's a much larger population than the territorialists. Uh, and with very few exceptions, contribute nothing to uh, Israel's physical defense. And as that population grows, both in size and in political power, and is able to ex exert its sway over, over, over Israeli politics, what I think we're seeing is an accelerated departure of the seculars from Israel, because it's it's kind of a convenient and correlated fact, the seculars are the ones who have options. You know, but going can... back, to, back to my original question, that sounds yeah. pretty accurate to me. Yeah. What's changed? So you said you got something wrong about the theocrats. Yeah. Are they contributing more than you thought they were? So first, I, I never thought they would read my book, and they have. <laughs> so uh, I... I I was approached by, by a gentleman by the name of Eli Palais, who is the editor of a magazine called Mishpacha, which is the, turns out, the, the largest ultra-Orthodox population in circulation in the world, in uh, uh, Hebrew and Yiddish. Uh, I'd never read it before. I'd, I'd never heard of uh, Eli before, but he asked me to dinner. Uh, and he showed up with a book with almost every page had a post-it note stuck in it. He had taken, you know, wow. the copious notes. And first of all, I was, I was really kind of swept away by this man as a, a, a true intellect. 
Um, you know, we talked about the economy and we talked about Shakespeare and we talked about Judaism. And I, I felt this is somebody who can hold his own in, you know, in, in many more fields than I can. And it, it, I, was, I was really kind of in, in awe. And at some point he said, I, I just have to you know, get it out of the way. I'm insulted by your book. I'm insulted. Uh, wow. And the, the, and this, this is the regret. You know, he said, it, it's so clear as you're reading, you dig very deep in your heart to find the love for every Jew in the world, whether it's the Columbia professor who's trying to get you jailed for war crimes or the settler who you think is committing national suicide on your behalf, you disagree vehemently with those people, but you love them and that's very clear. You don't feel that for Haredi Jews. You put us all in, you know, in, in, in a box and uh, we're, you know, we, we don't all fit in that box. And that began a very beautiful relationship and that I consider Ellie a, a, a real friend today. Um, and he's opened my eyes to some real nuance in that world, particularly in Israel, where you see, you know, and I'll, I'll, I don't want to uh, go too far down a rabbit hole here, but just to give you one example of what I'm talking about is a, about 10 years ago, a, a trend began in Israel that had all of the kind of secular world, myself included, kind of uh, alarmed, which was uh, rabbis from some of the ultra-Orthodox sects uh, getting their followers to move en masse to small uh, jurisdictions. And the first one was, was Arad, the small city in the desert uh, in mm -hmm. Israel. And you know, one of the you know just kind of democratic features of this of this population is they, they vote as a block. Whatever the rabbi says, that's what you do, which gives them a lot of political power in Israel, which we've seen in national politics play out. Our synagogue works the same way. <laughs> and 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 the idea was you overwhelm these municipal governments. Where by the way, voting you know it, it, voter participation in Israel is very high in national elections. It's very low in local elections. Right. So it's relatively easy to you know, quote unquote, take Rest over control. Yeah. Yeah. Of a municipality. Exactly. And the first city that, 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 that fell, I say in quotes is Arad. And something very interesting happened there. The, uh, I said, the, the incidence of, of Haredi enlistment in the army is extremely low in Israel, but where is it the highest within the Haredi community in Arad? And what the Eli's theory, which I've come to embrace, is by taking over the municipality and for the first time having to deal with tax collection and you know and 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 and, and garbage right. removal and uh, the Haredim uh, in Arad have had to deal with all sorts, you know wh whether it's uh, you know modern Orthodox Jews or Russian immigrants who are a quarter Jewish. Uh, they've had to actually, and, and understand, you know what, there's some people that are really wonderful on all sides. Um, and I, I think that that's a trend that's, that's beginning across Israel. It's in very early stages, but it, it, it does give me a lot of optimism for Israel, um, it, which again is one of the things I, I, I may have gotten wrong, but the regret, to a uh, long way of answering that question, my, my, the regret is I, I know the Haredi community in a way that I didn't when I wrote the book, and, and I wish I had I, 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 I dealt with it with more nuance and, you know, and, and subtlety. And given what your claim was in the book that secular Jews are starting to feel in Israel like suckers, or not starting, but they do feel like suckers, bearing the burden uh, economically and militarily for the other groups. Uh, do you feel that resurgent anti-Semitism in the world uh, would change, you know, this drive to leave the country um, simply because of fear of Jew hatred uh, growing around the world? Yeah. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's a complicated question. So first of all, I don't, I don't see that happening today. Right. I, I don't see Israeli Jews concerned about anti-Semitism and, 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 and you know, deciding not, to, you know, not not to leave Israel. You know, one of one of the things I think I kind of get right in the book is that we, you know, Israeli Jews and North American Jews have very, very limited perceptions of each other's reality. So, you know, most Israeli yeah. Jews have never heard of wokeness and have no no sense of real anti-Semitism in the United States or very limited. 
Uh, so that it would be kind of surprising, you know, to to most Israeli Jews that there was a march in Toronto, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know in, in, in support of essentially the erasure of Israel. That right. that that that's almost inconceivable to Israeli Jews if you if you most Israeli Jews if you ran it by them. So I, I don't think most are aware of it. Um, so you know, the th trickle, the fear of the trickle, is still present for you. Do you see yeah. it accelerating? That was your it, prediction it, in the book, is that what would begin as a trickle of secular Jews leaving the country would only accelerate the fewer remain. Yeah. So uh, look, I think we got a bit of a reprieve with COVID because it's just hard physically you to couldn't leave. leave right. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, and, and there's nobody who's actually running the numbers on this, you know, it's very, very difficult to judge because it, right. it, it, it's a very politically incorrect question. You know, I, I was struck when I was writing about a headline in, uh, I think it was in Haaretz, in one of the Israeli newspapers that, you know, which essentially 2017 um, is a record year in net immigration to Israel. Maybe it wasn't a record, but it was the, the, the best year in, in, you know, in, in, in decades. Uh, in net immigration to Israel, meaning immigration minus emigration. Uh, nobody's going to ask the very politically incorrect question, who is immigrating and who is emigrating? And can we rate them on the basis of their contribution to Israel's twin uh, 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 prerequisites to survival, military strength and economic strength? What is your suspicion, Tal, about who's immigrating and who's emigrating? I, it's not a suspicion. I know it. I can see it. The you know what we're, what we're what we're getting is a lot of French, uh, Ukrainian, R Russian uh, retirees who you know wonderful, m massive contribution in many many ways to Israel. Not in those two areas. Those two, those people are not contributing uh, militarily and, and 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 by and large probably not really economically either. And those who are leaving are the PhDs from the Technion who have the next, you know, multi-billion dollar startup, but they're starting it in Palo Alto and not in Herzliya. That's that that that's who's leaving. I'm, again, I'm, I'm I'm generalizing to to an extent, but uh, anybody who watches this, I think, would agree with that assessment. So your this trickle, while it may have taken a break during COVID you see things going right back to where they were. Even the great start-up nation, the, Israel prides itself for its uh, amazing environment to produce technological innovation. You don't see that being attractive for retaining local talent. Not oh, attractive it, it, enough. It, oh, that's it, right. It is attractive. Um, but you know, our, our ambition Palo should Alto be- Palo Alto is more attractive. Israel will just never be able to compete. For the time being, and but I will say in the last you know eighteen to twenty four months, the relative attractiveness of, of Palo Alto has gone down, and and Israel's probably gone up, and and this new government in Israel, if it's the beginning of something, um, of, of something different, could also bode very well for us. So let's the, talk about the new government. Yeah, blip in political time. Or revolutionary accomplishment uh, could be both. Actually, <laughs> it could be both. Uh, the short answer is I don't know. What I will say is this is not a coalition that ever could have come together in Israel uh, in the past. And yeah, you know, obviously this is not a. Uh, a natural alliance. I mean, that you 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 have almost the 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 most extreme right and the most extreme left in Israel, uh, in you know in, in the same in the same coalition. But the fact that it did happen is momentous, and it could be a, you know a, a, a tremendous opportunity. You know, it's brand new. Let's see how they behave. There's no question that you know that BB, who you know who was my roommate when I when I started Clarity. Um, and I admire tremendously as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a human being, um, is probably the best politician I've ever seen anywhere in the world. Um, that's not somebody you want lurking in the opposition if your goal is to keep you know, this fragile coalition together. So big, big challenges to, you know, uh, to that coalition. But let's see, L let's see. 
So Naftali Bennett comes into your office and says, Tal, I read your book. I need some help. Okay, well, I have this coalition now. And finally, I've got the ultra-Orthodox parties in the opposition and not in the government. I think we can do some amazing things. I need your list of priorities. What are you advising Bennett? Where do you think uh, his efforts should go um, in, in terms of producing the change that is most needed in your opinion, in Israeli society? So first, I think Naftali is actually very attuned to this specific problem. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. To on, which on specific that. problem? So to the secular Jews leaving the country? To the notion that Jewish identity for many Jews can and should be our primary identifier, or at least a very close secondary identifier. And the fact that most secular Israelis view themselves as Israeli before Jewish, and in some cases, just Israeli, Jewish is incidental. Uh, and many, if not most, North American Jews probably see themselves in a similar, in a similar light. Th that's something that doesn't bode well for our future. And that's something that I think Naftali really gets. Um, I think there's- there, there There's pause there for one second. Did everybody hear what Tal just said? Can you repeat that one more time? Because I love that. I think which you just said something really important. What he gets, you said this is what he gets, and this is the most important thing. You didn't say this, but I'm going to say it. This is the most important thing for the Jewish future. It's really important, and I just say it one more time. Yeah. So look, if 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 Judaism is an incidental identity to most most Jews, like being left-handed, uh, it really doesn't matter, right? I happen to have been born that. That's the box I tick on a form that asks for my religion. Uh, that really doesn't bode well for the Jewish future in North America or in Israel. Um, if we can embrace is maybe the wrong word, but re rekindle our appreciation for that identity, the, the, the rich legacy that we've been handed for free, uh, that's, that's a, very exciting, uh, a very exciting prospect for the Jewish people. If you ask me, it's an exciting prospect for the world. That's something that Naftali Bennett really gets. And, and you know, if we disagree on many things. Uh, that's something that I think he gets. So he comes. So again, he's in your office. Yeah. You say, Naftali, I think you really understand the importance of Jewish peoplehood. If we're going to keep the state of Israel alive, we're going to keep the Jewish people strong around the world. Here's what I'd like you to do. If you've got this team together with limited time, here's some moves that I think you should make that I think could really make a difference. So here, here's two, is internally be gracious. Okay, you defeated the Haredi parties. N now extend an olive branch. L let's decide what we really need from uh, Haredi Judaism in Israel. And I would say, and I, I don't wanna get political about this, we can get political about other things. It's just because this is not, not as interesting. Do we really need uh, Haredi males to be drafted to the army? Is that really important to us? What exactly are we trying to achieve in that? Or is it more important that we actually find a way to integrate into society and stop having these, we talk about, you know, I hate when people use the term apartheid in Israel, that's a ridiculous word to apply, but the apartheid that does exist in Israel is those three communities that I define, the secularists, the territorialists, and the, and the theocrats live completely separate lives. It's as though we're in different countries, even different laws apply to us. Right. We need to, we, we need to integrate. And I don't think that has to be through the army, for example. So I, I think being gracious in victory, uh, you know, assuming he can keep his seat for, for long enough to, to, to do this, and Yair Lapid, I think, is, is, is on board with this as well. Uh, yes, reach out to the Haredi community in Israel and see if, if, if we can't achieve a new, so to speak, a, a 2021 status quo agreement. Let's reset that. That's the Haredi number one. parties that have said that Naftali Bennett, you are a reformed Jew in disguise. You are a cancer on the country. You're yeah. saying extend an olive branch. Yeah. Be yeah. gracious. Yes. Gracious in Israeli politics, you know, excuse me for rolling my <laughs> eyes a little bit, but okay, we can always hope. Uh, yes. Uh, and and I, I, I agree with you. It's not, not a simple thing to do, but it, it's doable. And, and I think it's really important. For, uh, you're coming from the perspective, again, of ideology. For you, this is a, this is a, serious issue in Israel that must be addressed. And it, the country cannot go on 
fighting secular versus religious and secular versus religious. The time has come for a grand bargain between the, these two camps because um, uh, the country's future depends upon it. So I think that is well taken, your, your proposal. And then the second, uh, no less important, maybe more important, is we, we need another grand bargain and that's with North American Jewry, right? And, and I, I say North American Jewry not to be dismissive of European Jewry, but it, it, there, there is an advantage in our concentration today, right? The Jews live in two jurisdictions in the world. Everything else is, you know, is, is small communities. And if there are French Jews or Argentinian Jews on the call, you know, I, I don't mean to be dismissive of that, but that's just the numbers. 90% of us are in North America and Israel. Yeah. It's never, it has not been like this for the last 2000 years. This is the first time in 2000 years where diaspora is not really uh, a, an appropriate term to describe the physical distribution of the Jews in the world. We're in these two jurisdictions and, and two jurisdictions that I think are still very philo-Semitic. And we can argue about that in a minute, but the, it makes it very convenient to actually build a bridge or a new bargain. Right, the bargain can no longer be what it was for our generations, which is you fight the wars and we'll write the checks. We, right. we both appreciate that it's important that there be a Jewish, a Jewish lifeboat in the world, because we didn't have one in 1939, and 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 if it were up to Hitler, I think he would have chased us out, and that would have been it. But no one would receive us. And today, we have that, and we sh that's that's not the bargain anymore. First of all, Israel stands on its feet economically. It doesn't really need our checks uh, 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 anymore. And Much we're the more, ones who are disappearing. And we're the ones who are disappearing. Right. That's right. Right. This is no, no longer a kind of a, a you know a vendor client relationship. This is this is this is this is a partnership. Yeah. Uh, and the only thing, it, it, you know, we can again talk about whether anti-Semitism can be our glue, as it was after the war. Um, I would argue against using anti-Semitism as our glue. We, it, Judaism has to be our glue. And again, that goes back to, I think, Naftali's understanding and Bougie Herzog's understanding, because Bougie is also somebody who I think gets it. He gets it. Uh, if, if Israel is, is, does not stand for the Jews, then it shouldn't stand at all. What are we doing here? Right? It's really difficult to maintain a nation in the Middle East if all you want is just another democracy. The world has plenty of democracies. This is the wrong neighborhood to set one up. It's not democracy friendly. The Middle East is not democracy friendly. We need a real reason to be there. And if we're not the nation state of the Jewish people, all Jewish people, everybody on this call, we, we really have no, no justification for being. So are you talking about recognition for the various movements in the diaspora? What are you looking for in terms of the grand bargain that you think Bennett should strike with Jews in the diaspora? Is that about reform and conservative Judaism? Well, look, if, if you rolled your eyes at the notion of, of, uh, of graciousness in Israeli politics, you're gonna roll them twice now. <laughs> but but you, you, you know it from the book, it's, it's much more than that. It's much more than that. Right. So first of all, again, if, if, if we write off all of reform Judaism, the Israeli government, the seat of Judaism writes off reform Judaism, the largest organized movement of Judaism outside of Israel, we're, we're getting something very wrong. Either Reform Judaism is or Israel is. And I, and I, 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 think, it, I think it's Israel that's getting that wrong. But much more fundamentally than that, as, as I write in the book, if you don't have ownership, if you don't have ownership, then over time you will stop caring. And the deal cannot be, the bargain cannot be, you write the checks and shut up. The bargain has to be, you have a stake and you have a say in what we are, in what makes us the nation state of the Jewish people. Because if you don't, we're not your nation state. We're the nation state of the Israeli people, not the right. nation state of the Jewish people. And there's, there's no justification in that. There's nothing special uh, in that. And that means some sort of voting rights, as I put forward in the book. Right. This is in, the, in the book, for those who don't know, uh, Tal proposed that, uh, as, an, as an example, that diaspora Jewry get a vote for the presidency in Israel. As a, as a way of, of making a declaration that, that this is not just a state for its citizens, but also this, a state for a people. 
worldwide. And we have an incoming president in Israel who has embraced that plan. And, you know, I hope I, I hope we're able to actually. Has do he done so? He said that's something he would like to look into. Yeah, we gave a talk together. This is this is before he ran for president, but he was the head of the Jewish agency. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think today is very high on his agenda. We, we, we exchanged some notes after he was uh, elected. Uh, I, I, you know, he's got a lot going on right now, but it, it, he was able to confirm it's still very high on his agenda. And I think that, that that's, that's encouraging. So I want to push you a little bit on the point you made about the, the, bar, the bargain with Haredi society. And you're saying maybe we don't need them to serve in the military. When I, when I talk to a friends of mine who are secular in Israel, I think they they might have something to say about that. Is there anger uh, in Israel from secular Jews, uh, from this growing number, against this growing number of Haredi Jews who are exempted from the army? And is there a way to reconcile that anger without mandating military service across the board for all citizens? No exceptions. Right. Well, first of all, there already are exceptions, right? There, 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 there are plenty of exceptions. The Haredi exemption is not the only one. Right. Um, the, you know, if, if we look at it as a, if we could take emotion out of this for a moment, and we'll reinsert it very soon, but if we take it out for a moment, the army doesn't need these people who by and large come without math skills, without language skills, without, you know, without the benefits of a secular education. There's just not that much the army can do with them. And the burden is quite significant because, you know, the Israeli army has always been pretty gender friendly. Um, you know, the women in combat roles from independence, right? That this is, uh, to have a group that, that, that can't even see women if they're dressed in a certain way, and I'm not talking about bikinis, I'm talking about Israeli army yeah. uniforms, uh, is a massive disruption to the way the army works. And I, I think actually a, a tear in the fabric of what makes the army work in, in Israel. So by, you know, by, by imposing that on the army, I don't think you're doing the army any favors. You know, it's, it's not like we're missing, uh, you know, th th there are certain roles in the army that, that are understaffed. Uh, but in general, the army is overstaffed in Israel. Right? The army is, 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 by and large, more of an employment machine and a kind of a social integration machine right. than, than a defense uh, you know, uh, 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 organization. So I, I don't know that we need that. It, but that said, I, I don't think secular Israel should be breaking its back to pay for study stipends for people who are completely capable of working and earning a living themselves. Uh, and when it becomes millions of people, then it, it's going to become it, it, not, not just a source of resentment. It's going to become completely unfeasible. There's going to be no way to do it. Um, that, that's, that's something that I think we should all be looking at. I, I don't think the army is a critical piece of it, though. What does your friend say when you propose that to him? Your friend, the friend who pub, the publisher of uh, Mishpacha magazine. What does he say when you say, well, maybe we shouldn't be paying all this money to, uh, to yeshivas and to help offer stipends to families who can work. So, so what I found both in Eli and, and, and quite a few other people in, in the ultra-Orthodox community is an acknowledgement that yes, that this is not sustainable. We, we understand that, we, you know, we, we get it. By the way, and we, we should also be, be clear, most of Haredi Israel lives in real poverty, right. real poverty. I mean, not malnutrition, but uh, you know, seven, eight, nine people in small apartments, um, you know, the, n no real prospect of economic independence, uh, it, you know, in, in, in any way. Uh, it's not like they're getting rich off of the, of, of the work of the seculars in Israel. They're just getting by. And I think, I, I, you know, if, if you have even a very basic understanding of, 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 of the economy, you understand that we're at the end of our rope here I mean, because that population is expanding. You know, every 10 years, there are many, many more mouths that have to be uh, fed. And the, the GDP growth in Israel and, and tax revenues, is, consequently, are just not keeping up. So, it, so the it, acknowledgement, we're reaching a breaking point. The acknowledgement of its insustainability is where we can begin to have a conversation. 
perhaps. I think that's right. And, and to be and clear, then it might be the right guy to do it. I, I think so. And, and I just want to be clear, it's, an, it's certainly not universal acknowledgement. Elie right. Palais is a very special person. I don't think he's representative yet of, 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 of Haredi Judaism in Israel. But like he said, don't paint us with, with such a broad brush. There, there are you know, many views within Haredi Judaism. So we have limited time with you tonight. I want to spend some time talking about the recent conflict with Gaza. Uh, two main views out there, I would say, about the conflict. One is this is this is this is a run of the mill lawn mowing, grass cutting that once in a while the IDF has to embark on in Gaza. But there's a different view out there that there was something different about this recent escalation, particularly with regards to Arab Israelis and their protests in the cities and towns against, or, or I guess they're uh, participating in an Arab uprising uh, across Israel from Gaza all the way, uh, all the way up through um, the Galil. So how do you see this? Is there, was there something different about this recent escalation? And does uh, does it's does the ceasefire seem to you to be just a temporary um, a temporary stall on further conflict? Ceasefire is definitely temporary. I'll, I'll, I'll stake a lot on that. This is this is I our think today. There was there was something. Is that right? Okay. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> good. So yeah, that that's that that's um, you know the, the, un, unfortunately the reality that it, this the, this will continue we can talk about wh why i think that's the reality um the unrest within israel is in my view not directly connected to that right yes it was sparked by it and, 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 and you know, for sure um it's kind of ironic that that unrest which is pretty historic you know, to, to be to be clear, this is not something we've seen. Uh, certainly not in my lifetime uh, in, in Israel. If you kind of the, you know scenes from the streets of Lod, which look like lynch mobs or you know pogroms in in you know in 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 in, in Russia or Ukraine 150 years ago, that's what that looked like. Um, with police, you know, refusing to enter certain neighborhoods, it was real. You know, for for a week or two, was you know kind of. A, a, very frightening, much more frightening than what was going on in Gaza. Um, and at the same time, we have, for the first time in Israel, Israel's history, an Arab party in the coalition, right, in, in, in the government. So this kind of very, very, very kind of uh, um, strange, strange combination of events that, 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 that's happening in Israel. I, I think it all comes down to something quite fundamental that I think Israeli Jews in general understand um, and acknowledge, and most North American Jews do not. Um, and look, and I, and I say this as somebody who has a, a Palestinian business partner to this day, and um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the dovish side of Israeli politics, so th this, this won't, <laughs> so pl please take that in, that in that context. The Arab world has never reconciled itself with Israeli sovereignty, never. Uh, and, and to be clear, the 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 we're very blind to that here right you can look at the middle east and divide it into the places where jews can exist and the places where they can't and you'll see that with zero exceptions the only place a jew can exist in the middle east is under jewish sovereignty there are no exceptions right the Baghdadi Jewish community is 1,500 years older than Islam itself, and it has been cleansed to extinction. There are no Jews in Baghdad. Right. There are no Jews in Damascus. There are no Jews in Cairo. There are no Jews in Sana'a. The Jews have been expelled from the entire Middle East. It, it, it kind of gets me a little bit <laughs> upset when I see things like ethnic cleansing in Israel. Where's the ethnic cleanse? We're, we're terrible ethnic cleansers. We, we have a, a growing Arab population in Israel. What are you talking about? But that's never looked at on the other side where there actually has been, I mean, total ethnic cleansing. There are no Jews anywhere out, outside of Israel. By the way, right. that holds true for Palestine as well, right? 1948 to 1967, Judea and Samaria and Gaza were both under Arab rule. 
not only was Palestine not established when it could have been on exactly the land that we're talking about for Palestine, but all Jews were expelled. That's all right. Jews were expelled or killed uh, from that land. There were no Jew that set foot in that in, in that territory between 1948 and, 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 and 1967. This is a truth that Israelis understand in their blood because their grandparents were from Baghdad or from Cairo. And they know there's no going back and there's nowhere else for them to go. And the fact that you know, you, you've know you got somebody who is willing to sacrifice everything to lob missiles at your children, right? Sacrifice the prospect of progress, of peace, of prosperity, just to harm you is something that if, you know, when you're sitting in New York or at Columbia University where I get into trouble all the time, I understand it. It's very difficult to even conceive of that. Very, very, uh, it, it just doesn't seem part of our, our, our reality here. But Israelis understand that because they see it. It's right in front of them every day. So this is why I think the, 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 this Gaza cycle is going to continue. Uh, I'm not that hopeful that we, you know, we, we, we can find a solution to that. And I'm very concerned that what we're seeing within Israel, which you pointed out correctly, I think it, that's, that's, that's what's new here, is, is a genie that we're not going to figure out how to put back in a bottle. In that, that there's there, this refusal to reconcile with the notion of Jewish sovereignty extends even to Israel's Arab citizens, or many of them. By the way, you, you could look, there's, there's nuance there as well. I want to be careful not to paint with too broad a brush. Christian Arabs in Israel are not part of that. There's definitely been a, a, you know, a, a divide that's been, that, that's been established. The Arab identity in Israel is much more religious than it used to be. Um, and e even within the Muslim uh, a, a population in Israel, I think there, there's, there's a very wide diversity of views. Uh, but clearly there, there are enough who, who feel this way that, that, that we experience what we experience at that time. That, that, by the way, in the Arab-Israeli conflict, that's the only part of the Arab-Israeli conflict that really scares me, existentially. Everything else, we, I think we know how to handle. We don't know how to handle our own citizenry, right? That's been a very challenge, challenging aspect of Israeli democracy from ever, for, forever. You know, when we use terms You're like- saying how to handle Arab-Israelis. How to handle a, a population that, you know, I would say- We're I hostile you know, to- Yes, there, there is a fifth column in Israel. You, you'd be, it, it's ridiculous to deny it. It's ridiculous political correctness to deny it. There are people who are cheering as the rockets land in Israel. Israeli citizens cheering as the rockets land in Israel. Right. Israeli members of parliament who are dedicated to the erasure of the country that they represent. That, that, and, and, and make no secret of it. I, I, don't, I don't know if that's not a fifth column, I don't know what is. And, and so the accommodation of that, of, of that view uh, in a fragile democracy in the embattled Middle East is, uh, by the way, it's not something I think we, we can be very proud of at, at having navigated for the last 70 some years, but it is a real threat, I think. So I agree with you. I think Israeli Jews, you're, you're right, they get that 100% that the root of this is a failure to acknowledge Jewish sovereignty and, the, and look at what happened when we didn't have Jewish sovereignty in these countries all around us. But now I wanna ask you, do you think American Jews understand that? What do you make of how American Jews reacted to this recent conflict? And some proposals that are getting tossed around out there like, well, let's talk about a binational state or a federation, or let's talk about Israel not even being a democracy uh, anymore. You yeah. read this stuff like I do. Yeah, I actually passed Peter Beinart on the street. Actually, I didn't want to say OAM. Peter Beinart, but oh, you're, we're, we're, you live in the actually, same neighborhood. Okay. <laughs> we do. We do. And, and we go, our kids go to the same school, and I think he's a nice guy. I mean, so I, what do I, you say to Peter Beinart? Peter, Peter Beinart says two state solution is dead. Right. So, look, I, f first of all, I, you know, here there is a real diversity of views. And, uh, you know, so it, it is painful to me to hear you know, Jews who are of kind of P Peter's persuasion on this, on this question. I, I do think, and, you know, I, I say this to him, and I, I, you know, it is what it is. There is something very disingenuous about it. Um, in that 
it's not your children. It's not your children who will have to face the wrath of the Arab mob. It's mine. Uh, so for you to make that decision for me and to publish it in the New York Times, uh, I, I, I think there's, just, there, there's a lapse of integrity in that. Are you willing to put your money where your mouth is? Are you willing to go spend a week in Gaza and, and see what is, because that's, that's, I mean, is, is there any illusion that that's what it'll be? That's, that's who's going to be ruling you if you have a binational state. Right. Put your keep on and go there for a week with your kids. And then let's talk at the end of that week. So Beinart uh, and his ilk are naive. I, I don't, I don't think Peter's naive. I, you know, we, 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 this is not about, about Peter, but there, you know, I, I think Stalin. We'll stop the recording of, for this section. If you want to speak your mind, no problem. Is Beinart <laughs> no, naive? What's it? What, what is he? What are, what's his goal here? I, so look, instead of making it about Peter, look, I, I think you've got a few. A, I'm a not few making layers. it about Peter. I, I'm, I'm asking you about American Jewry. Right. A, a growing number of whom, are, especially during conflicts, follow are following Beinart's tweets and, yeah. Yeah. and his ideas and seeing, hey, I don't want to support a country that's at war and that shoots children and, and innocent people in right. Gaza. Uh, who can't defend themselves. Right. So look, I, 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 I think there's good news and there's bad news. The, the good news here is something I think I'm seeing on college campuses, at least in the United States. I, I don't know what it looks like in Canada today, but, but in the U.S., Jewish students who finally understand that there's no bargain to be had because the bargain for the last 20 years has been if you push Israel under the bus, we're going to accept you in the progressive circles that you think you belong to, uh, right? If we, um, you know, if 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 you if you're for women's rights, if you're for gay rights, if you're for racial equality, you should be against Israel, right? I and mean, I saw some, someone sending around a cartoon today uh, saying uh, that, that there's a, a picture of us, some march. Um, with a, a bunch of people in the flag with a flag saying queers for Palestine. Um, and the kind of the meme on the bottom is, is an equivalent mark with a, bunch, with a bunch of chickens saying chickens for KFC, which, which I thought mm -hmm. was kind of cute because if you're gay in Gaza, your, 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 your days are numbered, right? Literally. So it, it's kind of, you know, it, it, it's, 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 this, it's very, very kind of strange, um, you know, ideology that says, you know, the, the, this is the intersectionality, uh, intersectionality, solidarity right? with all victims. Yes, right. The country that had the the first female head of state of any Western democracy is the, the misogynist country, right? Right. And, and in the Middle East, right, where we've got, where we, you need you need you need permission from your husband to you know to 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 you know to leave the house in in much of the Middle East. This is where the misogyny is. Is the so there, there's something broken, I think, in that. Look, I, I think Stalin had this right in his kind of concentric circles where you've got your cynics in the middle who understand that this is a lie. Uh, you know, it's a useful lie for whatever purpose we're trying to promote. You've got your ring of useful idiots around that, you know, Stalin's term. Um, you know, people who don't have the time or the inclination or the interest to really get into the, to the story. Uh, and I think that's, that's the big group and that's the group that I think we should be fighting for. Uh, among Jews, right? I, I, I'm not sure it's worth the fight uh, among non-Jews. I don't think we need to you know, win any popularity contest, but in, within our own people, when the New York Times puts that you know, very, very misleading headline, frankly, in my view, anti-Semitic headline with the pictures of all the children who, who, who died, and we're only now you know, finally realizing way after the fact that many of those children didn't die in this conflict. Of those who died in this conflict, many of them were killed by Hamas rockets, not by Israeli right. rockets. And of those who were killed by Israeli bombs, and you know, I, I don't know what the views of the people on, on the call are, but I can I can say that, you know, you're looking at the killer. I'm the guy. It was my my thumb on the button for 18 years doing exactly those things, and with with civilian casualties. Yes, I I caused civilian casualties. I'm I'm not a child killer. I mean, I think you 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 we we've, we've met twice. Um, I'm. I'm uh, you know, I, I, I come with love for all, all human beings, Palestinians as well, my enemies as well, even people who are trying to kill me. 
but what exactly, what exactly is a sovereign nation supposed to do? You know, the, the picture, uh, if, you, if you can picture this, this is a picture that I became very accustomed to over many years, is me at 35,000 feet at night watching rocket crews in, 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 my, in my lantern pond. They're, I, they're very easily targetable, but they're too close to civilians for me to target them under the rules of engagement that have been imposed on me. And you can see the rockets at night, you can see them arcing into Tel Aviv where my children are asleep. Right. And I'm watching that and I'm doing nothing. I'm doing nothing many, many times because we're, we, we, and, and by the way, you know, I, you know, I flew with the US Air Force, the US Navy, they think we're crazy to, to, to the verge of dereliction of duty that we behave that way. Uh, the, the notion that anybody, any, anybody in Toronto would settle for a government that does anything short of absolute no compromise defense of its citizens if Toronto were being rocketed, I, I, think, it, I, I think it's crazy. And it's disingenuous to demand of another population, especially Jews demanding it of Jews. That's saying your children are worth less than mine. Your children deserve to be under rocket fire for what? I'm not sure why. And, 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 and you can't do what it takes to defend them. You've got, you've got to do either this notion of proportionality, which I'm not sure even what that, what that means uh, when you well, have I one side. What, of I, I think you know this. What I think some young Jews will say is the Israeli government has made the lives of Palestinians, particularly in Gaza, so humiliating and horrible that they have no choice but to stand up for themselves. And this is how they do it. Yeah. How do you answer, how do you answer uh, a young Jew who comes forward with that and says, we're not saying that this is what is ideal, but we understand the impulse of an oppressed people to defend themselves or to, yeah. or to make their cause for liberation uh, known to the world. And the only way they can do it so that the world pays attention and that Israel pays attention is with, is with weapons. Right. Okay, I'd say a couple, you, know, you, you can answer that tactically on the level of, okay, let's assume that Israel's gotten everything wrong in this conflict for the last 120 years. Uh, and you know, here we are, you may have decided that, you, you may decide that we are irredeemably implicated in the, you know, in, in, in the ills of the Middle East and deserve to pay for it with our lives. But don't expect us to accept that logic. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sacrificing my children because of m mistakes that my parents may or may not have made. Okay, right. that, that, so that, that's just not a deal that's gonna, and if you're about solutions and you want peace, don't ask anybody to do that. Nobody's gonna voluntarily walk into the gas chamber. That's not, that's not gonna happen. So I, I think that, you know, I, I'd start with that, but I think much more fundamentally, Zoom out and ask yourself why you actually care about this. If you have the courage to answer that, why do you really care about this? So I, I got a letter. Uh, our, our daughter was, was br briefly enrolled at, at Brown University. She, she, she's in Israel now. But we, we got a letter as parents from Brown University last year um, celebrating the inauguration of the first chair in Palestinian studies of a major American university. And it's called the Mahmoud Darwish Chair in Palestinian Studies. Mm. So Mahmoud Darwish was the poet laureate of, of, of Palestine. I'm a fan. I, I, I love his poetry. I, I studied when I studied Arabic. I, it was one, one of my favorites. But what got me immediately when I saw that letter was, you know, and I didn't, my daughter wouldn't let me write this letter to the administration at Brown. But what it was said is that there's, there's something really interesting happening here. Why is there a chair in Palestinian Studies? There's no chair in Darfurian studies, South Sudanese studies. There's no uh, chair in Syrian studies or Rohingya studies or Uyghur Muslim studies. N none of those exist. Uh, what's so special about this conflict? I can tell you what's special to me is that the Palestinians are my neighbors and they're not going anywhere and I'm not going anywhere. I need to resolve my conflict with them. But why is it interesting to you in Providence, Rhode Island? When none of these other conflicts ever registered with you, there is no boycott, divestiture, sanctions movement for China over its, its occupation of Tibet or its treatment of the Uyghurs. N none of those conflicts even register. 
So tell me what's special about ours. Is it the number of people killed? There were more people killed in 2016 in Syria than in the history of the entire Arab-Israeli conflict, all sides combined. Right. 2016, and almost all of them were civilians. So it's not about body count. Is it about land that's a, a, a misappropriated? India, Pakistan, we're, we're, we're a footnote to India and Pakistan. Is it about refugees? Absolutely not. We're a footnote in the total count of refugees. And what is so special about this conflict? And here's the irony, is that Mahmoud Darwish, had they bothered to research it, said it himself in a newspaper article in 1996, which I could send around if you want. If you, if you want he actually interviewed for an Israeli paper. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing. but. What he said was, the world would never have heard the word Palestinian if our enemy were not the Jew. This has always been about you. It's never been about us. It detracts nothing from the justice of our cause. I mean, this man was not a Zionist. It detracts nothing from the justice of our cause or from our, our, our oppression. However, we should acknowledge it. It's always been about you. It's never been about us. And when I talk about you know, Jewish students on US college campuses today, that's, I think, gradually becoming an unavoidable conclusion. And it wasn't before. You had that bargain that you could throw Israel under the bus and gain acceptance. What's happened is that wokeness, I think, has, has, has progressed to such an insane place where it's actually becoming palatable to be overtly anti-Semitic, right? If, if the, the organizers of the, of the Women's March, I forgot the woman's name, uh, you know, is, is tweeting ecstatically about her relationship with Louis Farrakhan and can't even right. distance himself from his overt anti-Semitism. That, 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 that's, that's a coin that drops. You know, it's very difficult to get on board with, with a movement that says explicitly, there's nothing you can do to change. Your name is Goldberg. You are the enemy. You are the problem. I don't care so whether you, you support You this think or... American Jews are starting to understand this, that they'll oh, never look, be I... good enough for Look, I, I think starting is, is, is it, that that's actually a difficult. That there's there's an assumption in that in, in the in the word starting that this is maybe the beginning of some secular trend. I don't know that it is. In fact, my instinct is that it's cyclical and it, it will it will uh, I don't want to say fizzle out, but it will ebb and flow. In in that, look fundamentally, we're, I, I think we're getting a lesson right now in anti-Semitism, in that. What is really wokeness about? There is a, you know, and I think Marx got this right, is, you know, that they're human beings, like every other species, come into the world with asymmetry in their ability to contend with the challenge of success. Some of us, it, some, success comes easier to some of us than it does to others. And that breeds resentment. And you have a community that consistently, for whatever reason you want, and we can hypothesize all we want, but empirically, this is the fact. The Jewish community, wherever it is, whether it's in Morocco or in France or in the UK or in Canada or in the United States, becomes conspicuously successful in every field, academics, the arts, even sports, business, politics, right. it's conspicuous. Our representation is, you know, when, when people say Jews control Wall Street, the, the only thing that makes that untrue is a very subtle nuance is that we're not coordinated. You know, because when I get in the elevator at 712 Fifth Avenue to go up to, to Clarity, I can tell you that most mornings, everybody in the elevator, that's the hedge fund hotel, almost everybody in that elevator, or sometimes everybody in that elevator is Jewish. And the success right? breeds um resentment resentment yes and i i think that's that that and, and wokeness is i think the exemplification of that because there is a community in the united states that you know for again we, we don't without getting into the reasons just like we don't get into the jews but black americans have fallen short on their ambitions pretty consistently and what we're saying right now is nothing else matters but the result right equal outcomes that's that's really what we should be seeking which is a fantasy of course right and a fantasy that if, if outcomes if, are not equal then somebody is oppressing somebody else correct right. right and and look every every experiment in political history that has tried to achieve equal outcomes has ended in tyranny tyranny 
not sh falling sl uh, slightly short of your ambition, it's ended in tyranny, right? The Soviet Union, tens of millions of people right. killed over, 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 over this ideology. I think the United States doesn't go down that road. If I had to guess, this, this is a cycle. I mean, I think America is, 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 is still the, the, the best experiment in self-correction on a societal level that, that you know, I've ever seen. I, I do think we recover from this. I don't know when. It's not, it's not right now it's yeah. not in any case. But I, but I think American anti-Semitism specifically correlates with, with exactly this. And, and we could do a follow-up, not with you, to talk about uh, whether, whether Canada's uh, approach on this issue is similar or whether we are heading down uh, a different path. We're a, we're a more uh, left-wing country politically. Um, we're, we're over time now, but I wonder if you could give us any closing remarks that you have, maybe directly from, from the book. Um, by the way, I thought you were just brilliant tonight. I always learn uh, speaking to you. I think you have a great deal to, uh, of, of, of wisdom in the world, and you should write that letter to Brown. It, tell your daughter, um, you should write it to the world. I think uh, you are a great, great spokesman for truth out there. And tell us that from your, uh, with some closing remarks, what book would you write today to save the Jewish people? Well, I, I, I don't know if there's, a, if there's another book on that. I would say though, at least in, in me, but one of the things that I, I, I highlight and I keep coming back to in the book is this, this tension between the well-being of the individual Jew and the well-being of the Jewish collective, right? They don't rise and fall together. In fact, th there's often right. a, a kind of an inverse correlation between the two. And I think we're at a place today, when I wrote the book, I think we were at peak Jew on the, uh, on the individual level. There was never a better time in 4,000 years to be for a Jewish person, yes. for a Jewish person, yeah. correct. And the challenge that that imposed on us was, can we still remain coherent and unified as an identity when there's no hardship or no anti-Semitism to keep us together? And I think what we've gotten in the last you know, 18 to 24 months is not a surge of anti-Semitism. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not being dismissive or, or you know, uh, minimizing what's, you know, what, what's happened. But I would still say that by and large, the individual Jew in the United States or in Canada can ignore his or her Jewishness if, 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 if that's their choice. You can still mm -hmm. do that. Uh, and I don't think that's, that, that, that's going away. So the challenge is still upon us. But I think we have been reminded, at least those of us who are kind of tuned in, have been reminded that we can't take it absolutely for granted that th this, this golden Medina is gonna stay that way forever. We can't take it for granted. America is not immune to history. Uh, and again, I'm not saying that that's what's happening, but we can't take it for granted. And you know, again, I don't want anti-Semitism to be our glue because there are much, much more beautiful glues for the Jewish people that we should be using, not anti-Semitism. But we also shouldn't be above taking advantage of, of the fact that we, 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 we've gotten a jolt to our identity this is a moment that I think we can use to to grow it, especially with young Jews, which which I think is what we should be most focused on. And we've got a great, you said, a, a government in Israel that might be able to bridge that gap right now. There's an awareness of anti-Semitism renewed in, in the North American Jewish community that can give us the push we need. And I think a new government with different concerns and more sent more uh Priorities more sensible to these dilemmas, where we might be able to bridge this gap. Is that your your assessment for where we find ourselves today? And a hopeful. Uh, yes, hopeful I think assessment. you sum summarize it very well, and it is hopeful. You're right. Well, thank you, Tal. On behalf of uh, on behalf of everyone at Beth Tikva, we really hope that you'll join us again because uh, the the problem with you is you keep throwing out such great stuff, yeah. and we be and I want more. So I hope Thank you'll you, join Rabbi. us again. Israeli politics, who knows, might have another election sooner than we, sooner than we expect. And, and uh, your thoughts about um, a rapidly changing world uh, are always uh, give us focus. And I think today, tonight, particularly a moral center. 
um, by which to by which to assess. Right. Uh, thank you. So, Tal Hatzlachar uh, Abam. God bless you, and and uh, hope that your ideas can just proliferate into the world, so that uh, for the for the welfare of the whole Jewish people. Thanks, thank everybody. You, thank you all. Have a good night. Thanks, Tal.